Wonderful. Well, thank you all so much for joining us for tonight's program. I've sort of tweaked the title. I'm calling it the LGBTQ plus history of Massachusetts. Uh, so tonight we're joined by uh, Joan Elakwa, who is the executive director of the History Project for a presentation and conversation exploring the history of LGBTQ plus people, community, organizing, and change in Massachusetts. Drawing on sources like court cases, diaries, letters, photographs, videos, oral histories, and more, Joan will take you through over 400 years of history from romantic friendships to Boston uh, marriages, the, the Gay Liberation Front, to marriage equality and beyond. And she's gonna do it all in one hour. And uh, briefly, uh, the History Project is Boston's LGBTQ plus Community Archives, a nonprofit established in 1980. The History Project documents, preserves, and shares the history and stories of Massachusetts LGBTQ plus community. I always struggle with acronyms, Joan. I don't know why. So as I mentioned, uh, Joan serves as its executive director. She's a graduate of UMass Boston's Public History Master's Program. She sits on the Massachusetts State Historic Records Advisory Board. And in her free time, she likes to read queer romance novels with her wife uh, and cats and design subversive cross-stitch patterns. Uh, so I again want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library for sponsoring. Uh, so everyone watching live and those that will watch the recording on demand, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Joan for joining us here tonight. And Joan, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thank you. That was such a lovely introduction. I am very glad to be here. I'm actually uh, coming in from Waltham. So we are all across the state, it seems like, which is really wonderful. And so hopefully you all can see my screen. Uh, tonight, my presentation will be going over 400 plus years of LGBTQ plus history in Massachusetts. Uh, we're going to give a broad overview about some of the uh, people from Massachusetts who have made changes here, who have made an impact on our history. Uh, we won't talk about every single person, um, but hopefully you'll learn something new and I'm really happy to answer your questions uh, either right now or after the presentation, uh, whether you're here live or uh, tuning in on the recording. So, um, before we start, I just want to introduce you a little bit more to the History Project. We are a community-based independent archives, and we are focused on documenting and preserving the history of Boston's and New England's LGBTQ plus communities. And the work that we do is to share that history with LGBTQ plus people, organization, allies, and the public. We have uh, an independent, or we're one of the largest independent LGBTQ plus archives in America. We have over 250 collections in the archives, um, ranging from, you know, photos and diaries from the 1940s all the way up to digital records that we're bringing in right now. And then we have a lot of ephemera as well. T-shirts, buttons, flyers, uh, protest banners, you know, basically anything you can think of we either have in the archives or I can point you in the right direction if you'd like to learn more. Um, as Robert said, I'm a public historian. I'm also an archivist. And so my work is really to highlight stories that have been hidden or ignored over time. Um, and I just want to say I'm a member of the LGBTQ plus community. I'm a lesbian, uh, but I'm also, you know, a white cisgendered person. Uh, and it's really my privilege to be able to tell you some of these stories of people from Massachusetts uh, who are part of the LGBTQ plus community. So I mentioned some of my sources include court cases, uh, newspapers, diaries, photographs. Uh, the History Project released a book in 1998 called Improper Bostonians, which is a really great resource if you'd like to learn more about some of these folks. Um, and our outline here is basically we're gonna start pre-colonization. We're gonna go up to the gay liberation movement. We'll touch on the last 50 years, but we're really gonna focus on that pre-1969 period. Um, and I just wanna say in terms of like 
language choice, the people we're talking about didn't use the same language that we use now to describe same-sex relationships or attraction. We are here in 2023 talking to each other. I tend to use the word queer to describe this history because we're talking about it right now. Um, but with the understanding that people in the past probably didn't identify with the terms we use now um, or identified as anything other than heterosexual, um, if not for any reason other than that the words didn't exist during their lifetime. I'm happy to talk more about that. Language and labels can get a little uh, specific. <laughs> so starting at the very beginning, before Massachusetts uh, was a colony. So in Massachusetts, pre-colonization, we know of Native American and indigenous communities who had same-sex relationships, depending on the tribe or group, um, people who we would now probably consider gender fluid or non-binary or part of the modern trans community. And so prior to the Puritans landing in Massachusetts in 1620, uh, nations of Native people lived across America. Um, actually, before the Puritans landed, there had already been um, an epidemic that wiped out lots of people in, in New England um, before 1620. But before colonizing this land, now known as Massachusetts, those tribes included the Massachusetts, the Wampanoag, Pawtucket, um, and others. And so a term that's specific to Native identity, but that wasn't actually coined until 1990 uh, is Two-Spirit. And Two-Spirit is considered an umbrella term for Indigenous people who uh, encompass both masculine and feminine spirits. Not all transgender Native American people consider themselves Two-Spirit, um, but some people identify with that label. And so uh, this is a tradition that is over 400 years long um, before, you know, colonizers tried to erase and assimilate indigenous uh, identities and traditions. Um, that tradition is being kept alive now by people like Geo Sakmata and Neptune, um, and they're pictured on the, the left. Uh, Geo is a member of the Passamaquoddy tribe. They're actually from Maine, um, but I think they're likely the most famous or well-known two-spirit person in New England. Um, and they were the first trans person elected to public office in Maine as well. So they're a history maker in their own right. But the pilgrims landed here, or rather they landed in Provincetown first and then in Plymouth, uh, fleeing religious persecution in England. They established a Christian settlement here in Massachusetts with particularly strict rules and roles within families and society for men, women, and children. So on the right here is a 19th century engraving uh, of Captain Miles Standish observing the quote unquote immoral behavior of the Maypole festivities at Marymount, which was in what is modern day Quincy. Uh, the Plymouth militia overtook the Marymount colony in 1628 uh, because of its blasphemous activities. Um, the colony itself had consisted of formerly indentured servants, Thomas Morton, who led the colony, as well as Native American people. And Governor William Bradford, in his history of Plymouth Plantation, described it uh, like this, quote, they set up a maypole, drinking and dancing about it many days together, inviting the Indian women for their consorts, dancing and frisking together, like so many fairies or furies, rather, and worse practices as if they had a new revived and celebrated the feasts of ye Roman goddess Flora or ye beastly practices of ye mad Bacchanalians. Uh, and in essence, the Plymouth militia chopped down the Maypole. They arrested Morton specifically for quote unquote supplying guns to the Indians. Uh, Morton was put in stocks. He was given a trial. Um, from what I understand, they wanted to corporally punish him, but he eventually was marooned on the Isle of Shoals off the coast of New Hampshire until an English ship could take him home. Uh, he was too well-connected and well-known to be imprisoned or executed, um, as really later became the penalty for blasphemy in the colony. So during the colonial era is when we see some of the first and earliest statutes against same-sex behavior. Um, and as early as 1636, New Plymouth Colony listed um, sodomy and buggery among eight offenses punishable by death. 
uh, in the 1641 Massachusetts Bay Body of Liberties, the following law was included, quote, if any man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination, they both shall surely be put to death. Uh, one of the, or the earliest, I think, lesbian same-sex court case in Massachusetts happened in the Plymouth Colony in the 1600s. Um, part of how we know that LGBTQ plus people existed is because of these laws prohibiting them and because of the people who were um, either tried due to these laws or punished because of these laws. Um, generally speaking, in the 17th century, same-sex attraction was considered moral degeneracy, and the punishments were imposed as, as penance. Um, they believed that sodomy would, quote, provoke fire from the heavens on the entire community, not just the people engaging in it. So They're very serious about shutting that down. As we, you know, move through Massachusetts history, uh, as late as the 1970s, we're still talking about these laws because they were still in the books uh, in Massachusetts, some more uh, easy to enforce than others. But even at the first pride in Massachusetts, uh, statutes stating to the Puritan times were on the list of demands that the LGBTQ plus community uh, gave in front of the Massachusetts State House. Jumping forward about a hundred or so years, um, I wanted to highlight two Revolutionary War heroes um, who were what we would now probably consider part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, Deborah Sanson is probably the one that you've heard of. She is pictured on the right. That's a, a picture from the frontispiece um, of her uh, biography from 1813, I believe. Um, Sampson disguised herself as a man and joined the Continental Army in 1782. And she enlisted under the name uh, Robert Shirtleff, um, which was her brother's name. She fought in several battles. She was injured. And then her quote unquote true sex was found out. But she had uh, contributed to the war effort. She ended up being honorably discharged and then later in life, wrote a book about her experience. Um, she petitioned to receive an army pension and she wanted her husband to receive spousal benefits. So her 1797 biography implies that she had romantic liaisons with women while disguised as a soldier. Um, but it's unclear if that is part of the storytelling or you know, if she was what we now might consider part of the bisexual community. Um, another woman, Anne Bailey, was also caught in Boston, um, but she was caught very quickly and punished uh, and fined for cross-dressing and trying to join the war effort. Um, the other person who we unfortunately do not have a, a photo of is George Middleton. On the left there is a picture of the Bucks of America flag from the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, and George Middleton's house on Pickney Street on Beacon Hill is now the oldest extant house on Beacon Hill. Um, and George Middleton's story is an example of how historians can interpret fragmentary history and sometimes read between the lines to try to better understand the private lives of uh, people from the past. So George Middleton, his year of birth is unknown. Uh, he was the leader of the Bucks of America, which was an all-Black Revolutionary War regiment. Uh, in 1787, he built a home on Beacon Hill with his friend, who was a hairdresser, Louis Clapion. According to some historians, Clapion and Middleton lived together as a couple for about four years in that home, and then uh, Clapion decided to get married, and they split the house in half. Uh, some sources suggest that Middleton also got married. Um, it's hard to trace back in the, the church records. I don't think he actually was married, um, but throughout his life, he was a really important and esteemed member of Boston's Black community. He was a philanthropist, uh, and he maintained several close relationships with male friends. Um, upon his death in 1815, he left his entire estate to Tristram Babcock, 
uh, who in his will he described as, quote, a mariner and good friend. And so it's, this is inconclusive. You know, it's really hard to know when someone doesn't write about their own thoughts and feelings, how they may have described themselves, how they may have identified, especially when we're trying to put modern terms onto people who lived in the 17 and 18 hundreds. Um, but he wasn't, Middleton's experience was not typical. It was not um, normal to live with men in the way that he did. It was not normal to leave your estate to a friend like that. And so the evidence there, like I said, is inconclusive. We may never know, but I think it's important to talk about when we think about LGBTQ plus history, that sometimes we are trying to uh, read between the lines and make conclusions to connect uh, the community now to the past. The next story I have though is exceedingly well documented, which is why it comes next. Um, and this is actually a person from Rhode Island, uh, but it's just right across. Somebody said they're from North Attleboro in the audience. So we're almost there. Um, this is the public universal friend. And the friend was born in Rhode Island in 1752. Um, their birth name uh, is not the name that they used throughout the latter part of their life. So I'm not going to use it now. Although if you search for the universal public friend, you can find it. Um, the friend was raised as a Quaker. And in 1776, they contracted a disease. Um, historians think that it was typhus, but the friend became bedridden and near death with a high fever. Uh, after their fever broke, the friend awoke and reported that their former self had died, their soul had ascended to heaven, and the body remained with a new spirit charged by God to preach his word. And so the universal public friend began using the name the, univer the public universal friend, they refused to answer to their birth name, and they asked not to be referred to with gendered pronouns. They dressed androgynously or sometimes masculinely, and they began to preach. Uh, they gained a following. Their followers referred to them as the public universal friend, the friend or the PUF. And when the friend was asked if they were male or female, they responded, quote, I am that I am. Uh, eventually, in the 1790s, the Friends followers built a separatist religious community in upstate New York, and that thrived uh, for a few decades. The Friend died in 1819, and their followers, who became the Society of Universal Friends, um, existed through at least the 1850s, and they sort of disappear in the 1860s. Um, part of what's so exciting about the Friend's life in this story is that we have very clear evidence about how they perceived themselves. Um, I think partially they had some leeway because of the religious work and preaching that they were doing. Um, and there's also some leeway that comes when someone claims to have been given an ecstatic rebirth by God to live as they wanted. Uh, but they're this really early example of somebody living openly in a way that we would now call probably non-binary or gender fluid, um, way before the terms are in use. Uh, By the 1800s, a lot of the evidence that we have about LGBTQ plus people starts coming in the form of letters and diaries that are uh, including, that include the personal thoughts of their writers. Um, I usually joke that this slide is everyone you read about in English class, uh, transcendentalists, authors, and poets. So from left to right, we have Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was an influential thinker, a poet, a transcendentalist, and he kept a journal. Uh, while he was a student at Harvard, in his journal, he wrote entries about another young scholar who was named Martin Gay. And Emerson was totally obsessed with Martin. He waxed poetically about Martin in his journals. Uh, and even though later in his life, he edited and removed portions of his journals, uh, we still see diary entries dedicated to his obsession over Martin, uh, of whom he had a crush on for at least two years. Um, there are even sketches of Martin inside the diaries. Uh, next down the line is Henry David Thoreau, um, likely best known for Walden. Uh, and in his poetry and personal writings, we start to see his interest in romantic feelings for other men. Um, 
1839, he wrote a love poem called Lately Alas, I Knew a Gentle Boy about a guy who he'd spent the summer with. And I'm just going to read you that poem. It's really lovely. So was I taken unawares by this? I quite forgot my homage to Congress. Yet am forced to know, though hard it is, I might have loved him had I loved him less. The next two on this slide are Nathaniel Hawthorne and uh, Herman Melville. Uh, the two of them met in 1850 at a literary gathering in the Berkshires. Um, Hawthorne was 46 years old, Melville was 31, and they started this kind of intellectual obsession with one another. Um, Melville reviewed Hawthorne's short story collection, um, Moses from an Old Manse. Um, one historian looking back at the review calls it an editorial serenade. The two of them corresponded frequently, although only 10 of Melville's letters to Hawthorne survive. And Melville dedicated Moby Dick to Hawthorne. And if you've ever read Moby Dick, it has a very intense relationship between protagonists Ishmael and, and Gweek Gweek. Um, when Moby Dick was published, it received uh, really negative reviews. Uh, in particular for its homoeroticism. Um, Hawthorne actually gave it one of the very few positive reviews. Um, and in letters following the review, it seems kind of like Melville doubled down on his obsession and interest with Hawthorne and Hawthorne retreated from their friendship. Um, in other sources, I've read that uh, Melville had an eye for uh, attractive young guys later in life. Um, so I think it turned out well for him. Uh, Emily Dickinson is the last person on this slide from Amherst, Massachusetts, and she was really intense in her ardor for several women throughout her life. Those women included her sister-in-law, Susan Gilbert. Uh, later on, it included Gilbert's childhood friend, Kate Scott. Um, Emily wrote a poem after a night together with Kate in 1860. This is the poem. Her sweet weight on my heart a night had scarcely deigned to lie when stirring for belief's delight, my bride had slipped away. After Dickinson died in 1886, um, the majority of her poetry was made available. Uh, evidently, her family didn't know that she was so prolific, and her poems were heavily edited as well by her family to remove references to her female love. Um, you will see if you spent any time on social media, uh, a quote from Dickinson about licking the back of a stamp of uh, one of the letter that one of the women sent to her. So she was kind of intense um, about her interest in other women. These are not the only LGBTQ plus authors and poets from Massachusetts. Um, you know, Walt Whitman, Louisa May Alcott, later on in the 1800s, Henry James. Um, but I wanted to give you a sampling of some of the folks we know about from the 1800s. In a similar vein, um, we have several artists and actors who we would now probably consider part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, mostly I want to talk about Edmonia Lewis. She is uh, pictured on this slide all the way on the left. Uh, she was born in about 1844. She was uh, of Black and Ojibwe Native American heritage. Um, her exact date of birth is unknown, partially because in her um, later life when she was an artist, she mythologized her early life. She really played up the idea that she was part of a tribe. In reality, it seems that she was born in upstate New York and spent most of her childhood in Newark. Um, but she describes herself and her teenage years as, quote, until I was 12 years old, I led this wandering life, fishing and swimming and making moccasins. I was then sent to school, but was declared to be wild. They could do nothing with me. There are records of her grades. She was a really excellent student, actually, um, but she was very committed to presenting that she had this kind of wild upbringing, and you start to see that in her artwork later on. Um, she attended Oberlin College. She was one of very few students of color. She was one of very few women at the school. And after several incidents, um, one where she was accused of poisoning her classmates, it seems like she might have slipped them some alcohol and they got ill. Um, she ended up leaving the college without graduating, and she ended up here in Boston. Uh, she wanted to train as a sculptor, which was an art form dominated by men, and after being turned down by several sculptors, 
uh, she finally worked under Edward Augustus Brackett, and he specialized in marble portrait busts, which is what she also specialized in. Um, she became famous in Boston in particular for her bust of Robert Goldshaw from 1864. That's on the left on the screen. Um, and once she had enough money to do so, she left America entirely. In 1865, she relocated to Rome, where she joined an active community of American and British artists living abroad. Uh, that colony was overseen by Charlotte Cushman. Charlotte Cushman is in the photo all the way on the right. She's the woman standing. Um, Emma Stebbins is sitting next to her. Um, Cushman was an actress. She was born in Boston. And she was well known for appearing in theater in male roles in particular. She appeared in over 30 male roles throughout her life. Um, her first was, you know, as Romeo in a production of Romeo and Juliet, where her sister played Juliet. Uh, and Cushman oversaw this feminist international colony in Rome in the 1850s and 60s, where she invited other independent women to live and to work. Uh, and Charlotte Cushman was kind of what we would now maybe call a player. She had a lot of uh, lovers in this colony, including Emma Stebbins, who was also a sculptor, who's pictured with her here. Um, artist Harriet Hosmer, who's another Massachusetts-born sculptor. Uh, and Edmonia joined their group in 1865. Um, she wrote about her move uh, and, quote, I was practi practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. The land of liberty had no room for a colored sculptor. Uh, Edmonia's entanglements are not entirely clear. She was welcomed by Cushman. She lived with Cushman for many years. Um, she never had a public partner. Uh, at one point, she declared she was getting married. She never did. Um, and she gained international acclaim for her work in her lifetime, um, some of which, if you wanted to go look at locally, adorns graves in Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge. Um, but when she died in 1907, she was relatively unknown. Um, her work was forgotten over time. She's gained a lot of attention again. Uh, and was just recently on a U.S. postage stamp, actually. So in Mooney's life is one where um, sometimes I joke, you know, usually straight people don't hang out with a big group of lesbians in Rome. Um, but that whether or not uh, she engaged in same-sex relationships or uh, attraction, she found kindred spirits in these other women who were living abroad and uh, trying to do their work. She, I find her very interesting, um, and I could keep going on, but we only have a short amount of time. Uh, I wanted to share with you the term Boston marriage, uh, as well as the term confirmed bachelors, but uh, a Boston marriage essentially it was a partnership between two women who had the means to support each other. This is a term that started being used, um, actually was used for the first time in a novel by Henry James in 1886. Um, he described in his book, The Bostonians, that some women in Boston lived as a husband and wife instead of marrying men. Um, the couple that he talks about in that book were inspired by his sister, Alice, and her par partner, Catherine. Um, and so we see women of means who are graduating from women's colleges, who are uh, engaging in partnership with other women, and then living together for like several decades and traveling together and writing very lovely letters to each other. And um, the idea of a Boston marriage is sort of uh, based on the, the idea that these are two women who are partners. They may or may not be romantically entangled. Um, some of them we know were definitely romantically entangled. Some of them may have been really close friendships. It's hard to know. Um, they're called Boston marriages because they were so uh, abundant in Boston at the time. Uh, on the left here is a, an image from uh, Annie Field's memoir, Memories, Memories of a Hostess from 1922. And in it, uh, we see Annie Fields and Sarah Orne Jewett. Um, Sarah Orne Jewett 
uh, was born in South Berwick, Maine in 1849. She's a novelist and poet. She's really well known for her works about the South Coast of Maine. Um, her home in South Berwick, Maine is part of Historic New England's uh, catalog now. And uh, Jewett maintained a close relationship with Annie Fields and her husband, publisher James Thomas Fields. Uh, after James' sudden death in 1881, Annie and Sarah became lifelong companions. Um, the women traveled together, they lived together, they wrote extensive correspondence when they were apart from one another, uh, and they were partners until Jewett died in 1909. Um, after her death, Annie worked on her memoir, Memories of a Hostess, and uh, before it was published, her publisher suggested that she removed a lot of the intricate details of her relationship with Sarah. Um, the heavily edited book was published after Field's death in 1922, but her unpublished diaries with some of that uh, unedited work do remain at the Histo Massachusetts Historical Society. Uh, confirmed bachelors, on the other hand, that's an ambiguous and euphemistic way of describing a gay man. Um, an unconfirmed bachelor or a confirmed bachelor is an unmarried man. He's uninterested in marriage. He's uninhibited in his socialization. Um, you see in British newspapers sometimes a similar phrase, quote, he never married in obituaries to imply homosexuality. And so in this picture here, um, this is a photo from the guest book of Red Roof, which was A. Pied Andrew's home in Gloucester. Uh, A. Pied Andrew, who was born in 1873, was an economist, uh, assistant secretary of the treasury. He was the founder and director of the American Ambulance Field Service during World War I. He was a member of the US House of Representatives from Massachusetts. And in his home in Gloucester, uh, we see him hosting these uh, kind of lavish boys weekends on the beach in a lot of cases. Um, if you go through the guest books, which Historic New England has in its archives, you can see his just like roaring social life, the appearance of other um, guests who we know are part of the, the gay community um, based on the way that they're written about by other men of the time. Uh, there's a historian, Trip Evans, who's working on a book about this right now, actually. Um, and so in his guest books, you see that he's visited by people like Henry Sleeper, who is his neighbor, the creation of, uh, Beauport, the um, what is now the Henry Sleeper McCann House in Gloucester. Uh, in this photo here, this is a um, beach party from 1904, I believe, um, or 1911. I apologize. Oh, it's 1911. Sorry. Um, I put the citation there and still messed up the date. Um, uh, Andrew is on the far right of this photo in the front. And his longtime companion, Jack Mabbitt, is in the upper left. So a lot of the people we've talked about in the 1800s here are ones where they're documenting themselves in one way or another, whether that's through their poetry or their personal writing or through their letters. And the other way that LGBTQ plus um, people are found throughout history are the people who are caught, um, who are arrested or tried, uh, Massachusetts had a uh, law where essentially um, police could determine whether lewd and lascivious quote unquote activity had happened. Um, there were several cases in the state Supreme Judicial Court as early as the late 1800s um, trying to define what lewd and lascivious mean meant. And it was really, you know, you know it when you see it. And so some of the other people we know about didn't have the opportunity to share their own story, but we can still learn about their lives through how they were written about. And this is Ethel Kimball, all of these articles here. Um, I use the name Ethel because that's the name that this person kept going back to, um, but in their life they had many aliases, including James Hathaway, James Wilson. Um, uh, there was another, let's see, William something was another name they used. Um, but as the story goes, in, in 1921, uh, John Hathaway was arrested on State Street in Boston and was charged with stealing an automobile. And when police arrested John, they found out that John was actually a woman named Ethel Kimball. Uh, they 
finally figured out the story. They got uh, Ethel to explain what was going on. Um, Ethel had spent the previous two years uh, masquerading as a wealthy widower. Um, they had been telling people that they had graduated from MIT. And during that time, they got married to Louise Eichler, a girl from Somerville. And so before Ethel was arraigned in court, uh, police brought women's clothing to them and they refused to change. Um, Ethel claimed that, quote, I wore men's clothing because I wanted to approach life's problems from a man's viewpoint, especially the problem of unemployment. Uh, Ethel held a very long track record of arrests. Um, the earliest that I've found in newspapers uh, is an article from 1911 where Ethel is claiming to be Thomas Scotland's. Uh, where they're attempting to buy a car using a fake check. Um, after this incident in Boston, later on in 1924, Ethel gets married to another girl, uh, Pearl Davis of Parsonfield, Maine. Uh, the marriage doesn't last particularly long. Davis's nephew turns the couple into the authorities where Ethel's quote-unquote true sex is found again. Um, Ethel, throughout their life, served time at the Women's Reformatory at Sherburne in Framingham. Uh, they worked committed to the Boston Psychopathic Hospital at one point, and they're arrested over and over again. There are tons of articles about Ethel. Um, it's more or less every two years Ethel gets out of prison and then commits another crime and ends up back in prison. Um, but they continue to dress and live their life as a man. And so this is a, a story where, you know, Ethel likely didn't think of themselves as transgender, but I think if only for the fact that the term didn't exist yet, um, their struggles and efforts to live um, and present themselves masculinely, I think imply that Ethel understood themselves as a man and acted accordingly. Um, the term transgender dates to about 1965, but that doesn't mean that gender nonconforming people are not part of our long history here. Um, the kind of final note on Ethel in about 1930, uh, Ethel moves to New York City, where they continue uh, their life of crime, and uh, authorities in New York send a letter back to Boston asking, what's the deal with this person? And Boston uh, writes back, good luck, good luck with Ethel. So, and then they kind of get lost to history, which is unfortunate, but uh, they're a really interesting early figure. And this, as we are in the 20th century now, um, we start thinking about really what set the stage for the modern gay liberation movement. Um, after World War II, uh, we see a lot of lesbian women and gay men who served in the military or worked on the home front began to meet and create a queer community with one another, um, especially during the war when they were you know, working and living in same-sex accommodations. Um, after the world war, they were in a totally different world. Um, lesbians and gays were dishonorably discharged from the military during what's called the Lavender Scare, um, really, which was more or less an anti-communist moral panic, um, where queer people were considered national security risks, they were considered communist sympathizers, and so there were constant threats of blackmail, exposure, exposure public censure, and imprisonment to LGBTQ plus people during this time. And we see the community retreat to bars and private homes, um, both of which could be and were raided. And um, in response, two organizations formed that fostered the nascent public gay community in America. The first was the Mattachine Society, which catered to men. And the second is the Daughters of Belitis, which catered to women. Um, Mattachine was established in Los Angeles in 1950 by Harry Hay. And its name was inspired by medieval French mask groups uh, who would meet secretly and then anonymously criticize ruling monarchs. Um, the Boston chapter of the Mattachine Society began meeting at the Parker House Hotel in 1957. That uh, chapter was established by Prescott Townsend, who was a Boston Brahmin. Um, Prescott is pictured in the image on the left. He is the older gentleman, second from the left. Uh, he had been born into a prestigious Boston family. He attended Harvard. He served in the Navy during World War I. Um, during World War II, as part of the war effort, he took some work in Fall River. And as the story goes, he was caught in the act with another guy. Um, he was uh, 
charged with committing a quote, unnatural and lascivious act and was charged a fine, which he could have paid, he had money, um, but he refused to pay the fine. He ultimately spent 18 months in prison on Deer Isle. And this is considered the impetus for his organizing in the latter part of his life. He spent the rest of his life as an activist and organizer of gay men. He established the Boston branch of the Mattachine Society. And he also supported the gay liberation movement. Uh, it's rumored that he's the one who paid for the printing of the flyers that uh, shared information about Boston's first pride. Uh, the Daughters of the Lightest, on the other hand, they were founded by Del Martin and Phyllis Lyons. Um, they're pictured in that photo on the right. Um, it's a photo from the Gay Community News photo collection when the women came to Boston to see the chapter here. Um, and they were interested in creating a safer alternative for queer women to find community in than in bars. Um, the mission of their organization shifted to su providing support to women afraid to come out. They wanted to share their rights and their history. And the Boston chapter of the Daughters of Belaitis uh, was founded in 1969. Its early leaders included Lois Johnson, Sherry Barden, and Laura McMurray. And the Daughters of Belaitis, I would say, there was debate over what the group's purpose was when they started. Um, initially, they determined that they'd focus on personal and social support for lesbians, um, and then education of the public on lesbianism, and then lobbying to reform laws limiting the rights of lesbians. Um, when they first started, they didn't actually call themselves a lesbian organization. The, the term was still considered um, a medicalized and derogatory term. They called themselves the invert women. Um, but within a couple of years, they start using lesbian. It becomes the, the most widely used term. Um, as time goes on in the Daughters of Belaitis, you start to see younger and more politically active lesbians uh, leave the organization to either join or create more radical and activist oriented organizations as the movement picks up. Um, but the importance here, these organizations are part of what we call the homophile movement. It predates the gay liberation movement. Um, it's an early organizing effort of LGBTQ plus people. And the homophile movement's organizers set the national stage so that after the 1969 Stonewall riots, there were coordinated efforts to commemorate the uprising in New York City. And those coordinated commemorations led to our first pride marches across the country. So uh, to, to briefly touch on the Stonewall riots essentially in 1969, the Stonewall Inn, a bar in New York City was raided by police. Like I said, police often raided bars, uh, but the patrons kind of spontaneously fought back against the police um, and skirmishes continued throughout the week in um, Sheridan Square where the Stonewall Inn was. And a year later, these organizations began to commemorate that one year anniversary of the Stonewall uprising. Um, on this slide on the left is uh, a flyer from Boston's first pride in 1970. And on the right are images from Boston's first pride march in 1971. Um, and uh, Boston commemorated the one year anniversary of the Stonewall uprising uh, by holding, holding uh, a week of special events. Most of them were like in conversation with one another, panel discussions. Um, educational lectures, that sort of thing. There was a gay dance as well. Uh, in 1971, the homophile organizers uh, decided to have a march. The march was distinctly political. Um, it was preceded by a full week of workshops on various issues affecting the emerging gay community here in Boston. And then that uh, flyer was distributed really in a grassroots way from friend to friend through newsletters of the city's few lesbian and gay organizations. And uh, to quote that flyer, it said, quote, two years ago on June 27th, homosexuals in New York City for the first time refused oppression as usual. They stood up when the Stonewall Bar was raided. We and others across the nation commemorate that event this June. We celebrate the awakening of a vigorous gay pride and self-respect. The march here in Boston in 1971 um, was uh, not sanctioned by the city, 
uh, and a group of protesters between 200 and 250, depending on which source you read, um, stopped and read lists of demands at four different sites in the city. Uh, they started at Jacques Cabaret, which is a drag bar in Bay Village. Um, at this point, it's the oldest extant gay bar in Boston. Uh, they then moved on to Boston City Police Headquarters, which were on Berkeley Street at the time, then to the Massachusetts State House, and then St. Paul's Cathedral, and they ended with a rally and a ceremonial closet smashing on Boston Common. And the protesters at each of these sites demanded visibility, acceptance, protection, repeal of anti-gay laws that had been on the books since the 1600s. Uh, in front of the church, they demanded ordination and gay marriage. Um, and they concluded with demanding that the American Psychiatric Association remove homosexuality from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, uh, because at that time, uh, homosexuality was considered a mental disorder. And so uh, since 1971, Massachusetts has had so many milestones uh, in the continuing fight for equality for LGBTQ plus people. Um, legislation protecting the rights of LGBTQ plus people. We had the they called the Gay Bill of Rights, uh, passed in 1989, um, bills protecting LGBTQ plus parents and children, um, adoption laws, marriage equality came in 2004, continuing fights for uh, trans rights, especially in the 2000s. And these protections are still unfolding and changing, really. Um, we've seen in the last year or two a huge uptick in legislative attacks on reproductive freedoms, medical care for transgender youth. Um, last I heard, there are over 400 anti-LGBTQ plus bills introduced uh, across the country. And so even though we've had such a long history in Massachusetts, even though the LGBTQ plus community has been um, such an important part of our history, there's still work to be done um, to ensure, you know, rights and protections for all people in Massachusetts. And so as we head into this pride season, um, I hope you keep that in mind. Please go out and celebrate, show your support, but also, you know, support in whatever other way you can to ensure that, you know, the fight continues and that we move forward. And so I just want to say before we start Q&A, uh, I'm only a couple of minutes over what I guessed I would be. Thank you so much for being here with me. I'm happy to answer questions now. They can be questions about this or if you have other LGBTQ plus history or community questions, I'm happy to answer those. If you'd rather not ask uh, here or if you are watching this later, email me at info at historyproject.org. Um, as I mentioned, I'm a public historian and archivist. If I don't know the answer, I can at least point you in the right direction. Uh, thank you so much. So folks, let's give Joan a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful presentation. And uh, let's take roughly 10 minutes of questions. Uh, Joan, off the bat, just curious uh, for folks watching either live or on demand, uh, how could one go about supporting the efforts of the History Project? Yeah, so we are uh, an entirely really community supported organization. We're not associated with any universities. Uh, we only have a staff of two and then a volunteer team that helps us with archives, um, with research requests. So if you want to learn more about us, check out historyproject.org. If you are interested, you could make a donation there, but also you could learn more about our upcoming events. You could check up our, our YouTube channel where all of our events from the last two years are posted. Um, and we're always looking for volunteers. I'm especially looking for people who are interested in history, but, you know, can do things like balance a checkbook. So, you know, it takes all kinds uh, to support nonprofits. Um, I will say too, we will be at Boston Pride for the People this Saturday. And so if you are there and at the festival, please stop by and say hi. We'll have stickers that we're giving out and you can join our email list and yeah. Great. Uh, so Shelly says, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. Michelle says, this was a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, and she loves the old Barney Frank poster uh, behind you. I got that uh, at a, a, an antique store, just by the way. It's from the 80s, which I guess are antiques now. Um, that's not from the archives. That's from my personal collection. 
Uh, MD says that this presentation was uh, enlightening and uh, she thanks you. Um, so a uh, question from MD, uh, was it hard to find uh, information about uh, these historical figures? Yeah, I mean, some are easier than others, um, especially some of the more prolific and public people who leave behind lots of archives um, or who also have historians that, uh, and mostly English uh, academics who argue about their writings are easier to find information on. I didn't include, but like, you know, Walt Whitman, could be somebody that you can find out a lot about his personal feelings, especially if you read every edition of Leaves of Grass. Um, other people, though, you know, like with Ethel Kimball, the um, trans person from the early 1900s, uh, finding information about them is really hard. Uh, it involves, you know, looking for kind of the keywords and ways that people engaging uh, in either cross-dressing or masquerading would be described in that time, which are not the same terms we use now. Um, with somebody like that who used other aliases, sometimes it's hard to continue the thread. Um, and a lot of the, the figures that I have learned about over time, um, I actually learned about from other archivists of different generations, um, some from repositories where uh, their repository was not ready to talk about the sexuality of the person whose records they had. And so we kind of covertly heard more about them. Um, and then, you know, other places like actually the Gibson House Museum, uh, which is a really amazing historic house in Boston. Uh, their founder was a gay man. The History Project was calling him a gay man about 30 years ago. And the house is now interpreting his life in that way because the time, you know, the world has changed. Um, they have an excellent tour, just by the way, if you ever get the chance. Um, but that's some of the ways that we do this um, sort of history. And that's why I like to share stories about like Edmonia Lewis and George Middleton. Um, we can't always be definitively sure. Uh, but there are some people whose experiences, I think, really resonate with the community now. And um, so you find connections that way, too. Excellent. Uh, Susan, who was very very excited that you were here tonight, uh, Susan says, does Massachusetts still have any dormant anti-LGBTQ laws on the books, or have we cleaned all of those out? So we haven't. So it's not typical always um, to repeal laws that are um, either no longer able to be enforced or have been um, kind of overturned by more recent rulings. Um, and so in Massachusetts, actually, the, the lewd and lascivious law, uh, part of that was overturned in 1974, um, not specifically because of the gay community. Somebody uh, committed a crime and then demand, said that it was something between adults and it, it ended up being overturned. Um, so, you know, it's still on the books, but you really, how could you enforce something where there's not a definition of what you're enforcing? Um, we're seeing this in the news recently around Comstock laws, uh, which date to the 1870s, I believe, I think 1873. I'm a historian, but sometimes I'm in the decade and not in the year, um, where, you know, laws that said that you couldn't send anything obscene through the mail, how do you define obscene? Um, at the time, obscene included uh, anything to do with reproductive health. And so you see judges talking about this now saying like, oh, you know, in light of how Roe v. Wade has changed, uh, are we allowed to or not allowed to send prophylactics through the mail? And so that's more what comes up um, with, with anti-gay laws. Um, often you'll see like a Supreme Court case come through that will make these laws that are still in the books um, unable to be enforced. Um, if you want to learn more actually about uh, LGBTQ plus laws in Massachusetts and across the country, GLAD, um, the GLBTQ plus ad legal advocates and defenders, is a really amazing local organization um, that is constantly helping to make enormous changes in America. Uh, so uh, given the time, it looks like our final question will go to Joan. Uh, she says, fascinating history. 
Uh, what are your thoughts on how this younger generation is moving progress forward? And how are you documenting uh, things that happen on social media? Yeah, I mean, I think Gen Z is amazing. Um, I think it's really a, a testament to all of the work that um, the generations that have come, I'm a millennial, not a Gen Z, but everyone who's come before us uh, has made a lot of strides so that kids who are pretty young have this knowledge and vocabulary and feel supported enough to come out and start, you know, demanding change really early. Um, and yeah, I find that amazing. I think that it's really, really wonderful. And I think um, that, you know, those who come after us will continue to make progress in their own ways. And sometimes there are debates between generations about what, you know, the community should be doing or how we should be celebrating or that sort of thing. Um, but it's not a monolithic community. And I personally love Gen Z. Um, as for documenting social media, it's hard. Archivists have some tools, um, mostly we do without getting too technical, what's called web crawling, um, where you will input a website into um, a tool provided by the Internet Archive, which will then archive an entire website. The tool doesn't work super well in social media. Um, so you have these cases actually of like university archivists who are part of student groups on Facebook who are trying to document what the students are talking about. Um, at least for us, uh, we work with um, people who have electronic records. We are, are still working on our digital preservation plan officially, uh, but it's it's hard right now. You know, it's a lot easier to uh, delete a file than it is to lose every paper copy of something that you've had. So um, in the interest of brevity, I'm happy to talk about this more, um, but I will say it's a, a process that's unfolding and a lot of archivists across the country and around the world are kind of dealing with it as we um, as more and more becomes digital only and not paper too. Sure. So Joan, we'll start to uh, wrap it up. Uh, I'll say a few words and then I'll kick it back to you for any final thoughts or any final words. Uh, but folks, uh, just a reminder for those watching live, I'll look for an email for me tomorrow with the recording. I'll also include Joan, uh, Joan's um, uh, email address uh, with information about some other upcoming programs and uh, with the feedback survey. Uh, so let's give Joan a big virtual round of applause for a wonderful job. And Joan, uh, do you have any last words before we wrap it up? I just want to say thank you so much for being here with me. Um, happy Pride, everyone. If you get the chance, go out to a local Pride. There's so many across Massachusetts right now. And it's just really exciting to see the community out there, the community and our allies out there, you know, celebrating with one another. Um, and yeah, like I said earlier, if you ever have uh, an LGBTQ plus history question, I joke, if you ever have an LGBTQ plus history emergency, you know where to find me. I'm always happy to uh, help point you in the right direction. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Joan. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, thank you all for watching. Happy Pride Month and uh, everyone have a great night. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.